The railways of the northeast were at the heart of a revolution in transport. The area has a unique association with the pioneering days. Nunthorpe Station was built by the Stockton and Darlington Railway, the world's first public railway. I well remember being woken up each morning by the local freight which was labouring up the one in 40 bank from Ormsby. Living within earshot of the railway it did have its disadvantages. The noise of the Q6 would be enough to get most people out of bed. Even by the 1960s, the Whitby passenger services had passed into the hands of diesel multiple units. At that time, I was working as a draftsman in Middlesbrough and commuting to work by train. A new generation of DMU is now working for services. I never thought I'd see four-wheel rail buses again. I came to live in Nunthorpe in the 1960s and after spending the previous 10 years taking black and white photographs, I came to the conclusion that probably cine work would be much more suitable for recording the final years of steam. When I came to live here, this station was typical of many rural stations in the pre-beaching era, with its good yard, level crossing, cold stairs, and all the various things associated with this type of scene. Many of these stations in the northeast embodied a small coal business which was run by the station master. And this was quite a lucrative sideline. I can vouch for this myself because I used to help him to do his books. It's about 25 years since I last visited this station and I'm pleasantly surprised how little it has changed really apart from the loss of the goods yard. The mid-morning pickup freight was usually worked by Q6 but on this particular morning a WD austerity had been rostered for this duty. The mid-morning pickup freight would call at most stations between Ormsby and Stokesley. The austerity departs the yard with a lighter load. Throughout the 50s, I visited various line-side locations travelling to locomotive depots with the RCTS and many of the classes, such as this hunt, would only last until the early 60s. At one time, I had a brief flirtation with 9.5 black and white cine, but was not particularly impressed and so returned to the still camera. A few of the scenes are of interest, including this L1. It was after doing national service that I felt I would give Cine another chance and this time I opted for 8mm which of course gave me the colour and movement which is lacking from the black and white photography scene. The mass dieselisation programme of the late 1950s virtually eliminated steam workings on branch lines but in the early 60s a large number of steam haul rail tours over freight only lines brought passenger trains back to places which had not seen one for possibly 25 or 30 years. Black fives were fairly rare in the area. The standard class was really the B1s. In retrospect, I wish I'd taken more notice of them. At one time, they seemed to be everywhere, but withdrawal of the class came with alarming haste. I did try and record some of the more interesting locomotives. For instance, I got one shot of a K3 approaching York just one month before the whole class became extinct. This is the first of two volumes of my cine work throughout the Northeast. I hope it brings back a few memories. A fast, efficient modern railway bows little to tradition, but where the North Eastern and Great Northern Railways once met, 
crossing gates survive into the 1990s. More trains pass through Joan Croft than cars. Electrification has swept aside many of the more interesting features of the route. A Class 58 heads north from Doncaster onto former Northeastern metals. As all true Northeastern enthusiasts know, the Great Northern ending in a ploughed field four miles north of Doncaster. Remarkably, these were the words of Edmund Dennison, the GN's first chairman. We are literally a few yards from the immortal location near Austin on the original East Coast route. Approximately 230 yards north of Shaftome Junction was Askin Junction. The end-on connection with the Lancashire and Yorkshire Railway was the end of the line for the GNR. A super-powered coal train heads for Nottingley on the now freight-only route. How the mighty are fallen. Selby was the first major northeastern station 14 miles north of the GN border. The A3 precedes A1 Kenilworth, also heading south. On October the 4th, 1964, Mercury heads for York on a Home Counties Railway Society excursion. The Britannia worked the tour from King's Cross. Booked engine, Princess Coronation Sir William A. Stania, FRS, had thoughtlessly been withdrawn a week earlier. This is the same location today. These scenes were recorded almost exactly 10 years to the day since BR abandoned the route between Barby Junction, just north of Selby, and Chalna Wind Junction, near York. The new line avoided Selby completely, giving British coal access for open cast mining on the abandoned route. George Hudson was the first man to see the potential of a London to Edinburgh main line. The 1990s route has evolved from the complex political railway development of the previous century. The first section of today's route opened in 1829 as part of the Stockton and Darlington Railway. The line between Washington and Brockley Winds was opened by the Stanhope and Tyne Railroad. This was part of the South Shields to Stanhope line. The Q6 heads west near Brockley Wind. In 1838, Washington and Leamside were linked by the Durham Junction Railway. The following year, Gateshead was reached by the Bradling Junction Railway and York by the York and North Midland. The same railway extended to Nottingley and Normanton. York to Darlington trains were inaugurated by the Great North of England Railway. Original plans for the GNER included an extension to Gateshead. London and Tyneside were connected from June 1844 when the Newcastle and Darlington Junction Railway opened. Trains were from Euston via Derby and Normanton. South of Nottingley, the L and Y met the embryonic Great Northern. In 1849, the high-level bridge was opened by the Newcastle and Berwick Railway across the Tyne, linking Gateshead with its route from the north. In the same year, Brockley Winds was avoided by the York and Newcastle Railway. Normanton was also eliminated from the East Coast as the GN forged towards London. The southern section of the route was completed in 1852. A line through Retford replaced the former Lincoln route. A Gresley O2 Mark III passes.
The city of Durham joined the network in 1857 as part of the newly formed North Eastern Railway. In 1868, the Team Valley route was opened. Three years later, the L and Y was excommunicated upon completion of a new line south of York. After 15 years in the wilderness, Durham became part of the East Coast Main Line in 1872. Het Mill Crossing was also on this last section between Ferry Hill and Rally Mill. The North Eastern Railway was formed in 1854. Eighteen years later, the NER, GNR and North British Railways had completed the East Coast Main Line. Today, the former North Eastern headquarters in York is still in use by BR. But are the ideas new? The North Eastern had planned to electrify its section of the East Coast. In 1921, it ordered engine number 13, perhaps an unwise choice of number. 68 years later, electrification finally reached York. These scenes were recorded on the very first day. A Class 84, demoted to low test bank duty, was the first engine to test the juice. The appointment of Sir Vincent Raven as chief mechanical engineer in 1910 led to the electrification of the Shildon to Newport line and progress on the mainland electrification. Unfortunately, the First World War, the grouping, the LNER's dire financial status and their nationalisation somewhat delayed the plan. The first passenger locomotive was 91010. To the south of the station is Holgate Bridge. The old excursion platforms by this stage were already out of use. A B1 approaches on a train from Leeds. A V2 departs. The train is an interregional returning to the southern. These views were recorded in 1962. I came specifically to Holgate Bridge to try and film A4s. After two hours, I conceded and moved on. A K1 works a fitted freight passing Britannia John Milton. The Brit had arrived on a working from Lowestoft. They were not generally associated with the East Coast. The B1 returns with a little assistance. Approaching York Station is Flying Scotsman. The A3 by this stage was the only surviving member of its class the withdrawal of Prince Palatine a few months earlier in January 1966 had brought an end to BR operation of the A3s. 1966 also saw the demise of the A1s, A2s and A4s. Flying Scotsman was purchased in 1963 by Alan Pegler. The choice of locomotive was an obvious one. The A3 was the first officially credited engine to achieve 100 miles per hour. Withdrawal in January 1963 was followed by the return to apple green livery, replacement of the double chimney fitted since 1959, and German style smoke deflectors which were carried for just over a year until withdrawal. A few years earlier, A4 Sparrowhawk departs from Platform 15.
60018 was a Gateshead engine throughout its latter days. The Minion of New Zealand was from Top Shed. We continue north and austerity passes southbound through North Allerton. Much of the section between York and Erryholme Junction was quadrupled by the North Eastern Railway creating something of a racetrack. The South Yorkshireman Rail Tour heads for Darlington with an unusual Lancashire and Yorkshire and Midland Railway pairing. Houghton was one of my favourite locations on the East Coast Main Line, being only a short distance from my home at Nunthorpe. In those days there were four tracks and the clear view, both north and south, was ideal for photographic possibilities. Unfortunately, nowadays, the vegetation has grown up and considerably reduced this. A 9F heads north on an evening freight. A fitted freight heads south behind Peppercorn A1 Boswell. Rail tours often brought unusual engines to the area. The last Jubilee Alberta returns home during 1967. The train would return behind Flying Scotsman. On the 24th of October 1964, Union of South Africa returns a Jubilee Requiem from Newcastle to King's Cross. This tour was the last occasion an A4 departed King's Cross. In the same period, the last English A4 was withdrawn, leaving just 13 examples of the class in Scotland. In 1966, a merchant navy was one of the more interesting visitors. Lamport and Holt Line took over from Flying Scotsman at York on October the 22nd for a return trip to Newcastle. On the other side of the road, a private road leads down to Home Junction, where one would always be welcomed by the signalman, who was quite happy to contact control to find out the progress of any particular train that one was interested in. The full restoration of Sir Nigel Gresley at Crew Works was followed by a series of runs on the Air Force former stamping ground during 1967. Flying Scotsman was also extremely active. The A3 powers the East Coast Limited. This tour returned 4472 to London on the 4th of May 1968 after its non-stop London to Edinburgh trip on the 1st. Two and a half miles further north was Croft Spa Station. Dominion of Canada storms through on the up. At Darlington, 
A J94 passes the south end of the station on the avoiding line. Passing the steam shed on the approach from the north is Falcon. The A4 is followed by A2 Bronzino. Approximately 30 years later, the top link duties are in the hands of Class 91 Electrics and HSTs. Steam traction was displaced from King's Cross from June 1963. The introduction of the Deltics from 1961 led to the movement of the Pacific's primary into Scotland. The Indian summer finally came to an end in December 1966 with the withdrawal of Blue Peter, the last LNER Pacific. Darlington Station was never one of my favourite locations. The non-stop services and the interesting goods traffic would pass along the avoiding lines behind the brick wall, thus making photography difficult. The other problem was the size of the place, with bays at each end of the station serving branch line traffic. DMUs operated most of the local services from the late 1950s. Bishop Auckland, the destination of this train, was formerly a major junction. Today it survives entirely as a passenger terminus. A little to the north of Darlington Station was the steam shed. Standing on this derelict site, it's very hard to believe that this was once 51A, Darlington Motive Power Depot. The shed, which had quite a large allocation of locomotives, responsible for working most of the branch lines which radiated from Darlington to places like Saltburn, Bishop Auckland, Penrith, Richmond, and Barnard Castle. It also was responsible for many freight duties in the area and also provision of a standby Pacific which stood by in case of failure on a mainline express. The shed closed on the 26th of March 1966, displaced by a new diesel depot which has also since closed. During the 1950s, when I was building up my photographic collection, I regularly visited this shed about once a month with the local branch of the RCTS. Quite often, there were interesting locomotives to be seen, particularly new ones, built at Darlington, or existing ones which had just been outshopped ex-works. At the time, BR was still producing new standard designs. In the works, the Class II Moguls 78,000 series were constructed between 1952 and 1956 alongside the obligatory diesel shunters. Back on Shed is one of the town's oddities. Unfortunately, sometimes when special workings came up the main line, the Shed staff were rather reticent about allowing you in. Hence the fact that these scenes on the 29th of September 1962 had to be taken through a wire mesh fence. On this occasion, however, Perseverance got me inside to film the L&Y Class 27 before it returned to Halifax with the 4F. On the 13th of May 1962, a WD was given a rare passenger duty. The austerity was used between Banktop Station and North Road while the main tour locos were being prepared on shed for the return to Nottingham. Midland 2P 40646 and Schools Class Cheltenham were in charge of the RCTS East Midlander No. 5 rail tour. Both engines represented diminishing classes. The 2P had actually been withdrawn the previous week on the official life expiry of its boiler. It was given a reprieve to work the 300-mile tour. Bets were taken at Darlington for the racetrack run to York.
the 440s did not disappoint, achieving a top speed of 83.5 miles per hour. Continuing north, Het Mill was the only gated level crossing between York and Newcastle. A 9F plods north and A3 shot over heads south. Durham is 254 miles from King's Cross. Flying Scotsman approaches the station. A second tender was provided at the end of 1966 to increase water capacity. This tender, previously from Union of South Africa, potentially gave the A3 a range of 200 miles between water stops. This would particularly assist on the southern section of the East Coast, where steam locomotives were no longer catered for. In the station, A2 High Silla continues north. The A2 ended its days as a York engine. Another 50A allocated engine approaches light. This B16 was built by Raven, rebuilt by Gresley, and then rebuilt again by Thompson. We are now approaching Newcastle over the Tyne on the King Edward Bridge. Rounding the curve into the station is A3 Robert the Devil, a King's Cross engine. A J27 avoids the platform roads as another Wurzel designed locomotive acts as station pilot. The J72 pilots at York and Newcastle carried a variant of Northeastern livery sporting both BR and Northeastern railway crests. Miles Beaver departs on an up train. The A4 survived the Holocaust at Top Shed. As the Deltics were moved in, it was moved to Aberdeen. Some suburban services in the area were in the hands of electrical multiple units from 1904 until 1967 when DMUs were introduced. From Manners, two Northeastern electrics worked to the quay on the 1 in 27 branch between 1905 and February 1964. Electrics only disappeared temporarily from Newcastle. By 1973, plans were advanced to use the former northeastern suburban routes as the basis for the Tyne and Weir Metro. BR did not reinstate electrics in the city until 1991. The arrival of AC Electrics brought with it modernisation. The traditional junction at the east end of the station was severely rationalised. The most complicated junction in the world is no more. Early rail developments throughout the northeast were rarely the most logical for a north to south main line. The legacy of pioneering routes in the area offers a unique network of lines available in cases of emergency or engineering work on the East Coast main line proper. This HST passes Bedlington on a diverted King's Cross train. On this occasion, the main line through Morpeth was blocked.
Railways in the area developed to carry minerals, principally coal, from inland areas to the seaports. In the main, these ran west to east. It was the competition for trade between the railway companies which led to the building of the north to south links and the alternative main line. Probably the best known of the alternative routes is the old main line, or Leamside route. The line effectively bypasses the Team Valley and, if required, Durham. The route was opened by the Durham Junction Railway between Washington and Rainton Meadows near Leamside. The 1844 main line was regularly used for diversions until the 1990s. It was the building of the line from Ferry Hill, linking the south with Durham and the shorter Team Valley route, which effectively reduced the importance of the old main line. Tyneside based A2 Tehran heads south. Penshaw was on the original 1838 route and marked the junction of the 1853 built line to Sunderland. A J27 passes on a coal trip followed by an austerity. The lines in the foreground are part of the Lambton Colliery system, the colliery having running rights over part of the Sunderland line to stairs at Hilton on the River Weir. By the 1990s, all traffic originating on the route had disappeared. Just one train was booked to use the line, a speedlink freight itself living on borrowed time. The old main line was saved primarily for East Coast diversions while electrification proceeded towards Newcastle. 1990 was something of an Indian summer. The most impressive structure on the line was Victoria Viaduct, just north of Penshaw. An enthusiast's rail tour, the Tyne and Tees Wanderer 2, run by the Branch Line Society, crosses the River Weir. The completion of electrification on the main line inevitably led to closure. The route is officially mothballed, although some track has been lifted. Another alternative route once existed between Darlington and Durham. The 1857 built route connected the Leamside line with the S&D via Bishop Auckland. Numerous diversions used the line until closure in 1968. William Whitelaw works the RCTS Blythe and Tyne Rail Tour on September the 19th, 1965, through Shildon and Brantsworth. At the north end of the route, a complex junction, Deerness Valley, once gave access to five separate routes. On April the 10th, the Great Marquis negotiates Bridge House, then Belly Mill junctions to rejoin the main line. The K4 was already preserved. The bell which adorned the locomotive had been presented to Viscount Garnock by the Pennsylvania Railroad. In 1963, a five-day rail tour was run by the RCTS and SLS. Q7-63460 comes off the line from Concert and continues towards Bishop Auckland.
the east coast through Darlington retains its diversionary route. From Ferry Hill, trains pass over Clarence Railway metals as far as Stockton, then along the former Leeds Northern Railway as far as North Allerton. This somewhat indirect route was taken by the returning Blythe and Tyne Rail Tour. The A4 was one of the last surviving streaks, ending her days in 1966 as a Ferry Hill engine. On September the 17th, 1961, the Don Yor Da Flyer Rail Tour, featuring the Midland Compound, was booked to visit Darlington. However, number 1000 ended up at Eaglescliff due to diversions. A3's Shotover and Gay Crusader were also diverted. Brand new D9004 and D9003 were similarly inconvenienced. South of Eaglescliff is Picton Bank. William Whitelaw descends. The climb for southbound trains is 1 in 170. Jubilee, Alberta passes the box at Picton in 1967. Trains heading south on this line have two options as they approach Northallerton. Either they can rejoin the east coast just to the north of the station, or pass beneath the main line and proceed through Northallerton low level. A Liverpool to Newcastle service heads for Picton. The line straight ahead is to low level and also gives access to the east coast south of the station. The Great Marquis passes low level in April 1965. The Northeastern Number 2 rail tour had started in Leeds and continued via Ripon and North Allerton to Teesside. By diverging from the main line at North Allerton, it was once possible to avoid Thirsk, York and Selby. The usual diversion route was via Ripon and Knaresborough to York. Alternatively, the East Coast could be rejoined at Shaftholme Junction. The Queen of Scots Pullman service formerly used the Ripon line, but it was cut back to Leeds and renamed in 1964. At Melmaby, a B-16 approaches from Leeds on another RCTS tour. The route closed in March 1967 reopening briefly when DP2 crashed near Thirsk on the 31st of July. From Iron Horse to... This is the same location 30 years later. BR has eliminated virtually all of the alternative main line. It has no alternative. From the 16th century, Wooden wagon ways provided a means of transporting coal to the stairs situated along the rivers Tyne and Weir. One of the oldest railway bridges still survives in County Durham. The Causey Arch, built in 1727 on the Tanfield wagonway system, represents perhaps one of the most tangible relics of the bygone age before steam. The Tanfield Railway was relayed as an iron road by 1840, continuing in use until the 1960s. The 
preserved Tanfield Railway now uses this line. This flat crossing was once where the Tanfield and Bowes systems crossed. Springwell on the Bowes Railway is also the site of a preservation project. Most of the early wagon ways use a system of gravity inclines, winding engines and horsepower. By the early 1800s, several collieries had experimented with steam locos. It was one of these near George Stevenson's home at Wylam that inspired the pioneering engineer. The locomotion replica normally resides at the Open Air Museum at Beamish, home of one of the oldest surviving steam locomotives in the world. George Stevenson began building steam engines around 1814. His first major project was the Hetton Colliery System, which opened on November the 18th, 1822, using a combination of locomotives, winding engines and self-acting inclines. The eight-mile route transported coal to the stairs on the River Weir. In 1825, the world's first public railway opened between Stockton and Darlington. By 1833, numerous branches had been added to the system. Passing Fighting Cox on the original Stockton to Darlington main line is the Great Marquis in 1965. One of the most remarkable structures on the S&D was saved by the North Eastern. The first iron railway bridge ever erected resides in the National Railway Museum. It spanned the River Gornless near Etherley until 1901. Many of the NRM's Stockton and Darlington exhibits are on display at North Road Railway Station Museum in Darlington, including the original locomotion. North Road was the starting point of the first ever railway passenger journey, the S&D inaugurating services with horsepower. In 1845, Derwent was built. The museum also houses modern engines from the NER. 1463 dates from 1885 and 910 from 1875. During the 1960s, North Road was the location for scrap roads, Classes J26 and J72 await the cutter's torch. In Shildon, this public house was the starting point for the first train on the first public steam railway. Locomotion number one was preceded by a man on horseback waving a red flag. In 1975, the town celebrated 150 years of the S&D. Black 5, 4767, appropriately named George Stevenson, departed from the same location to mark Locomotion's famous journey to Stockton, completed on September the 27th, 1825. The Rail 150 celebrations included the naming of the Black Five, opening of a Stockton to Darlington railway trail, opening of North Road Museum and a cavalcade of engines between the now closed Shildon Works and Highington, where locomotion had first been put on the rails a century and a half earlier. Naturally, the replica of locomotion led the parade. In 1834, a serious threat to the S&D's monopoly was posed by the emerging Clarence Railway. The Clarence Railway offered a shorter route to the River Tees at Haverton Hill. At Haverton Hill, a B16 61418 returns the Durham Rail Tour from Port Clarence on the 13th of October 1962. The tour was run by the SLS, Manchester Locomotive Society and King's College Newcastle Railway Society. The B16 replaced a V3 at West Auckland for a trip over Clarence Railway metals. Earlier in the day, the tour heads for the Tees on the former Northeastern electrified route between Shildon and Newport. This four track section is where the lines from Shildon to Tees side and Ferryhill to Tees side converge. 
The Sim Pasture branch links Shildon and Stillington Junction, a Q6 passage. Eighteen thirty four saw the opening of the Stanhope and Tyne Railroad, the line connecting limestone quarries and coal fields to South Shields. In nineteen sixty three, the route was visited by the now preserved Q seven six three four six O on the five day SLS and RCTS tour. It was the iron ore trains from Tyne Doctor Concert which brought fame to the line in its latter years. Ten 9Fs fitted with Westinghouse air compressors worked the line until 1966. Services were occasional but intense depending upon when ships docked. A loaded train heads for Concert Ironworks. The original Stanhope and Tyne route featured numerous inclines. In 1893, a new deviation opened to the north, avoiding three of these. This one continued in use until 1946. The six and a half mile 1893 route was used for all through traffic, although even here gradients of one in 35 to Stanley would make the engines bark. The Q7 continues to concert. In 1965, the Northeastern Number 2 rail tour heads for concert with a Tyne Dock 9F. The Stanhope and Tyne Railroad was constructed on the Wayleaf system. The company paid each landowner for the right to cross their land. Unfortunately, the tolls became overpowering and the company became insolvent. It was dissolved in February 1841. The section east of Consett became the Pontop and South Shields Railway. Between Stanhope and Consett, the Derwent Iron Company took over. To the east, a K1 works to Burnhill and Waskerley in 1963. This section of line became part of the Stockton and Darlington Railway after the demise of the Stanhope and Tyne Railroad. The Derwent Iron Company leased, then sold the line to the S&D. The route initially survived to supply limestone to the furnaces at Concert. On the 10th of April 1965, this DMU took over from the 9F previously seen at Anfield Plain. At this stage, a thrice weekly sand train still ran to Wetherill, three miles to the west. Passenger services ended here in 1859. It was the desire to move minerals quickly which was the impetus for the railway development in the northeast. Passenger services were often born out of a need to get miners to remote locations. Coal was the principal factor in the creation of a rail network, the lines being built to the nearest navigable water, in the case of the Stanhope and Tyne, over 33 miles away. The last Q6 descends the 1 in 40 towards Ryehope and Sunderland South Dock. Right up until the end of steam in the northeast in autumn 1967, free group locomotives continued to work freight. The northeastern Q6s and J27s were the last pre-group engines in BR service. 
On the north of the Tyne, a J27 works another loaded coal train before returning north. Blythe engines supplied Blythe Power Station, stairs at Whitehill Point on the Tyne, Tyne Yard, and three power stations to the west of Newcastle, Stella South, Stella North, and Dunstan. Another J27 heads south. On T's side, the steel industry once generated a massive amount of freight. An Ivat Mogul heads north on steel flats. A WD powers a Dolomite train from Frislington, Ferry Hill, to the Steakley Magnesite Works at Cemetery North. Our last traffic flow is oil. On the north of the Tyne, a J27 shunts. Upon closure to steam, Percy Main's allocation of steam was exclusively J27s. These were moved to North and South Blythe depots in February 1965. One year later, the diesel shunter fleet was transferred to Gateshead and the depot was closed. The oil terminal closed in 1983. Freight on Tyne side and T side is a shadow of its former self. The steel, chemical and coal industries continue to provide BR with regular traffic, but today the tables have turned. Gradually, the emphasis has turned to passenger services. Our final section is north of the Tyne. A V2 and Deltic illustrate the transition from steam. Over 25 years later, the same stretch of main line has undergone another transition. A Class 91 passes Almouth on a service from Edinburgh. Almouth is one of just eight surviving intermediate stations on the 67 mile route between Newcastle and Berwick upon Tweed, once the northern boundary of the North Eastern Railway. The down platform was once an island. A small shed provided an engine for the branch to Annick. Amazingly, the signal box survived the modernisation. The station buildings were replaced during the 1970s. In 1966, K1 62011 drops onto the stock in the branch platform. The three mile line was the last passenger branch to continue with the regular steam haulage in the northeast. On the 18th of June, a 9F would bring down the curtain on steam activity. A K1 was the more usual motive power. A few minutes later, the train departs.
By this stage, closure of the line had already been announced, although objections would give the branch an extended stay of execution. Services ended in the hands of DMUs on the 28th of January, 1968. Our final view on the branch is the K1 passing over the River Arn with the returning 432 service from Annick. The North Eastern was not the only company to operate in Northumberland. The North British were neighbours but rarely friends. Our closing scenes are on North British routes in Northumberland. This is the Wandsbeck Piper arriving at Angerton on the 2nd of October 1966. Unusually, a pair of Ivert moguls, or flying pigs, was chosen for this tour. The station closed to passengers in September 1952 and freight in November 1963. The North British once had an extensive network of lines in this area, linking Rickerton Junction on the Waverley route to Reedsmouth, Morpeth and Hexham. The company hoped at one stage to reach Newcastle, but only got as far as Hexham, as the North Eastern Railway scuppered their plans. The wreath signals the end of this line and at the end of the North British in Northumberland. Pair return as the sun sets, the doyen of the class leading. This proved to be the last passenger train on the Morpeth to Woodburn branch, the final section of North British Railway still in use in the area. Woodburn officially closed to goods traffic the following day.